coffee, your morning cup of joe. So many people need it to get started in the morning. But hey, I'm not the only one. According to a quick Google search, 65% of all Americans need their daily cup of coffee to get going in the morning. But how did we get here? Where Wall Street bros and broke college kids are standing in the same line to get that sweet, sweet bean juice. Well, if you wanna know more, then keep watching, cause this is the history of coffee. The origins of coffee have been a long-standing mystery because people have been drinking it for so long. There is some lore surrounding the origin though, and a lot of historians seem to agree that coffee got its start somewhere in Yemen or Ethiopia. Kind of narrowed it down to that area. The most well-known legend about how coffee got its starts is from Ethiopia. Now the legend says that Kaldi, a goat herder, was noticing that his goats got really jacked after eating the leaves and beans off of this one tree. The coffee beans from this tree were clearly giving these goats a, a caffeine kick, and Kaldi wanted to investigate what that was all about. So he tries the beans for himself. After eating the beans, Kaldi was like, oh hell yeah, I see what this is all about. And he wanted to spread the love to his other humans. So Kaldi took the beans to a monk friend of his and was like, hey, take a look at these, they're really good. However, the monk did not agree with Kaldi. He thought this was the work of Satan himself. The monk threw these devil beans into the fire and summoned the most delectable smell you could ever think of. Like imagine never knowing what coffee smelled like and then immediately being transported to the coffee section of a grocery store. Those were my favorite places as a kid. You can tell I didn't really do much. I was kind of a boring kid. <laughs> Anyway, back to Kaldi and the monk. They realized their mistake. They were like, oh my gosh, it smells so good. We need to save these beans. So they quick got them out of the fire and then threw them in some water to preserve them. Don't know why that was the immediate thought, but hey, we're rolling with it. After a while in the hot water, voila, we have some coffee. Now, obviously this is a legend and there's many different iterations of it, but it's kind of a cutesy story, right? Regardless of exactly how coffee got its start, it spread really quickly throughout the world. The earliest evidence of the first coffee house that we know of was in modern day Istanbul in 1475. Sometime in the 1400s, coffee crossed the Red Sea into Yemen, and by the 16th century, it spread all throughout Persia, Turkey, Egypt, and Syria. From here, coffee got really popular and people really wanted a place where they could go and buy it. So coffee houses began to set up shop in the Middle East and North Africa. And at this time, coffee houses were not necessarily the equivalent of a modern day cafe, right? These places were where you could go to drink coffee, but they were more seen as places where you could discuss social change with your peers. So instead of going and independently like doing your work or chatting with a friend, you would probably go there and chat with some strangers or other people in your community. Coffee houses were kind of like the tumbler of the 15th and 16th century. It was a place where people could kind of talk about their shower thoughts like deep conversations. It was because of this reputation that coffee houses later became known as schools for the wise. Unfortunately, the man did not like all of this brainstorming of social change. They wanted to bring the working man down because in 1500, Mecca banned coffee consumption. Soon other places like Ethiopia and Cairo, Egypt also followed suit. The overarching theme here was since coffee was a stimulant and it like woke you up and kind of changed your overall affect, it was was ungodly, but people were pissed, okay? <laughs> they were rioting, and I would be too, okay? I am I am not above saying that I am addicted to coffee. I think any one of my coworkers could tell you that I seem a little off every morning before I drink my coffee. <laughs> Because people at this time reacted similarly to how I would react, uh, they lifted the ban eventually. It took about 15 years, but the government lifted the ban. And since coffee was legal again, it eventually made its way over to Asia and Europe. However, Yemen was like, baby, we're not just gonna give you the beans for free. We will roast the coffee, you know, make it all delectable and wonderful, uh, and then we will sell it to you. But you cannot grow the coffee yourself. You have to get it from us. 
Eventually, after many, many failed attempts, someone smuggled fertile beans out to India and India grew the beans themselves. And it was going pretty well, right? Like you can imagine that a warmer climate to another warmer climate, fairly doable to cultivate those beans. You know who else tried to do the same thing? The Dutch. However, it wasn't quite as easy to go north into cold ass Holland and try to grow those beans for themselves. It didn't work. Eventually the Dutch took some fertile beans and put them in one of their colonies Yay, colonial and they stuff. got to grow some beans for themselves there. Uh, but it took a while. Speaking of the Dutch, let's talk about coffee's path into Europe. And you know, when Europe catches wind of something good, it's game over, right? Yay, colonialism. I kid, but not really. <laughs> So eventually coffee made its way to Venice and the Venetians were like, they were hooked on the bean. Because of this, Pope Clement VIII uh, banned coffee because he saw it as a satanic beverage. However, the bean juices were calling to him, right? Because eventually he lifted the ban. So he baptized coffee and eventually named it as an officially Christian beverage. And again, like the Middle East and like North Africa, Europe also saw a boom in coffee houses. And again, they also became places of social discussion. By the 17th century, uh, coffee made its way to France and Louis XIV, uh, he got hooked too. And it, it wasn't just Louis, okay? All of France was hooked on this shit. And it was this French guy, uh, Gabriel de Clou. Sorry, French people, I don't speak French. But it was this guy who couldn't live without his coffee. So he brought some seedlings on his way over to Martinique in 1720. This sparked the first cultivation of coffee in the new world. Because up to this point, we've been talking about coffee growing in Africa, Europe, Asia, but not necessarily making its way over to North or South America. Coffee cultivation in the New World was a little slow at first, but eventually the beans made their way to places like Brazil in the 1800s. And from there, it really boomed. Because from about 1850 to now, Brazil has been the largest producer of coffee in the entire world. 200 years strong. Coffee cultivation has kind of been a sore spot in Latin America though for a while because historically, yeah, the climate is really wonderful to grow this coffee. It needs to be in a tropical area warm enough to survive. But who do you think needs to man those huge farms? It wasn't the white collar plantation owners. They forced a lot of the indigenous people to work on those farms and a lot of them had to be forced to migrate across different lands away from their families in order to forcibly work on these farms. Yay, colonialism. And during World War One and Two, Latin America's coffee market took a huge hit. See, Europe was getting a lot of their coffee as a commodity from Latin American countries during the World Wars, but they had to conserve resources during that time and really couldn't afford to buy more coffee from Latin American countries. The result was a huge economic hit to these countries. Today, like I mentioned, Brazil is the largest coffee producer in the world, but there's still a murky side to the ethics held by these plantation owners. But we're not here to talk about that. Let's focus on the one place that we haven't talked about yet. That's right, the birthplace of Starbees itself, the pumpkin spiced white chocolate mocha wonderland that is the United States. Surprisingly, it wasn't until the 1800s that coffee got really popular in the United States. Before that, Americans were drinking a lot more tea, but the Boston Tea Party really threw a wrench in that. The Boston Tea Party caused mass riots of tea to really say F you to the English. And it really seemed like our patriotic duty to really say fuck you to the English and start drinking coffee instead. By the late 1800s, coffee was a commodity here and everyone was hooked on the bean. But this only pushed for more technological advancements in the field of coffee. And that came in 1864 when Habez, Jabez, I'm so sorry, Burns uh, made the first modern modern coffee roaster. This newer coffee roaster didn't need to be held over the fire, so it was a lot less cumbersome to roast coffee beans. And this caused a huge boom in the commercialization of coffee because it was easier to get to consumers this way. 
right? And here we see big brands like Folgers and Maxwell House Coffee pop up. And since then, a lot of the original uh, coffee makers are really just duking it out to see who gets on top. Over the years, espresso and specialty coffees have become a lot more popular. Uh, and you have to wonder, with the widespread accessibility and commercialization of these products, how are people able to keep up with a rise in demand? Today, about 30 to 40% of the world's population drinks at least one cup of coffee every day. And this number jumps to 65% for Americans. And like I said, I'm not exempt from this uh, number, okay? Because I, I become a bitch if I do not drink my coffee in the morning. I think it's wild to think about how accessible coffee has become in the past you know, a couple hundred years even, because it takes an immense amount of effort to create the finished product that we see. First, the farmers have to grow the beans, of course, and then pick the ripe ones. Then they have to mill them and package them up, send them to a roaster. The roaster, you know, roasts them, whatever. Packages them back up and then sends them to the consumer. And those are only the beans that are not pre-ground for you. That's so many steps. For all that work, a plain black cup of coffee might run you, what, a couple bucks? Maybe five, six dollars if you're living uh, in a really high cost of living area or if you're just fancy and want to get something from a really fancy place. But how much of that money do you think is making it back to the farmer? Spoiler alert, not that much. If we go down this rabbit hole, it's, it's going to be a completely different video. But I did go down this really deep rabbit hole on the ethics of coffee. I read an 80 page paper put out by Nescafe that is complete bullshit in my opinion, in my humble opinion, allegedly, don't come for me. But if you wanna hear more about my take on the ethics of coffee, please let me know. I think it's really difficult to be in a position where you as the consumer really like this product and kind of addicted to it because I am. And then you're just like trying to pick up the pieces of like, well, what is ethical? What is the best thing for me to buy? You know, and things are just not that clear. And it feels like it's that way on purpose. I don't know, but that's where we'll leave this video on the history of coffee. You tell me if you wanna hear any more about the ethic side of things, but that's all I have for you. Let me know if you liked this video. I hope you did. I tried to change up the background a little bit more. Somebody told me that uh, I looked a little weird in the lighting in my closet, and I, I do, I did. <laughs> I hope this is better. Let me know if you like it. Uh, but yeah, I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.